Um, so I'm Sarah Lennox. Um, I am a professor emerita, hooray, uh, <laughs> since May 31st, but late of the program in German and Scandinavian studies at the University of Massachusetts. <laughs> and I'm the moderator for this roundtable on teaching the black German experience that's going to launch our next exciting two days. Um, so I am, I think like all of the organizers, maybe like everybody here, filled with excitement and joy that, this, that we are celebrating the second of these wonderful conferences and we hope with more to come. We are hoping that next year's conference will be at UMass Amherst. So it's not all sewed up yet, but that's what we're planning on. So, um, so as I said, I'm going, first I'm going to introduce the roundtable participants. Then I'm going to say a few words to introduce the topic. Um, then our participants will speak for about 10 minutes. Um, then I'll give them a chance to respond to each other if they want to. We may have to, I, I imagine Priscilla is somewhere snarled in transportation, so we may have to kind of regroup a little bit. And she has, a, I think, a pretty fancy um, multimedia presentation, so when she arrives, we may have to make a little pause in the discussion and get her presentation in, and then we'll come back to the discussion again. Um, so after, after the panelists have spoken, then we'll open the floor to discussion. And I know that many, many people out here have a lot of experience teaching the black German experience. So um, I'm very eager to hear what all of you have to say too. So we can, I think, regard our uh, panelists as kind of getting the ball rolling and then we'll, I hope, have a really productive and interesting discussion. Um, so let me introduce the panelists first and I'll introduce Priscilla in absentia. Um, she's assistant professor in the Department of Ger Germanic and Slavic Languages and Literatures at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. Uh, she completed her master's and PhDs in a PhD in German at the University of California at Berkeley. Um, she's presented papers at the German Studies Association and the Society for Cinema and Media Studies. She's published essays on such topics as German hip hop, Beine Werner Fassbinder, and translation. And she's currently working on a manuscript entitled Black Masks, German Rebels, Music, Mimicry, and Black Masculinity in Postwar German Culture. Next is Peggy Pisha, who is here. Oh, she is. <laughs> um, I she, Peggy teaches German <laughs> studies with an emphasis on women's and Africana studies at Hamilton College. Her recent uh, publications include uh, Museum Space History, New Political Tectonics, Weissein, Die Notwendigkeit kritischer Weisseinsforschung, uh, which is whiteness, the necessity for a critical whiteness studies, um, and um, Das Trauma der Schuld oder wie lässt sich koloniale Geschichte in einem postkolonialen Deutschland von heute denken, or The Trauma of Guilt, How Can We Think About Colonial History in a Postcolonial Germany Today. She's published on the development of modern subjectivity in the 18th century and the German Bildungsroman, as well as on literature and representation of ethnic minorities in 20th century German literature, uh, the blackface tradition in GDR films, multicultural images in GDR comics, black German women authors, and on critical race and whiteness, whiteness studies. She's received grants from the Volkswagen Foundation and the Alexander von Humboldt Foundation for collaborative projects on black Germans and black Europeans. Uh, Noah Zoll is a German author. She's here too. Um, uh, art, author, artist, media personality, musician, playwright, actress, scholar, and human rights activist. In 2001, she initiated the founding of Der Brauner Mob, uh, Germany's first black media watchdog association, 
whose goals she is actively committed to as chairperson. Her book, Deutschland Schwarzweiß, which I'm sure many of us know, uh, published in 2008, is based on her extensive experiences as an anti-racism activist and since its release has become a standard for the analysis of racism and critical whiteness in Germany. Um, she's, as Tina just told us, she's active on musical stages with her band Noiseau, uh, many of the songs dealing with political issues, um, as I bet we'll hear tonight, those of us who can make it that far. Um, tomorrow. Tomorrow. tomorrow, sorry, tomorrow, tomorrow. <laughs> okay, so we can rest and then. Uh, and her, her, as I, I'm sure many of you heard her wonderful lecture, keynote lecture at last year's uh, conference, uh, Geteilte Geschichte, the Black Experience in Germany and the US. And that is our wonderful panel. So let me now just say a little bit about w how we were thinking about um, the presentations, what we hope we'll be able to talk about in the discussion period. Um, so I think what is really obvious now to us, so gratifyingly obvious, is that black German studies is a really thriving research field. And as Tina's introduction made clear, I think in such good part due to the work of the Black German Cultural Society, also due to the um, energy and um, pro productiveness of the black German community in Germany, this field has been made visible and has become legitimate. Um, and I think it's just wonderful that in, in some ways even replicating the experience of black studies before it, this is a field that's been, that's come out of the grassroots. It hasn't come from the top down, it's kind of come from the bottom up and has been an expression of concerns that grow out of the community. So now our challenge is, and that's what this panel, this round table wants to talk about, um, how do we integrate what's come out of the community, what's come out of scholars, how do we integrate it into the classroom and pass it on to new generations of young people. Um, I don't know if it would be great if we could have an influence on what happens in Germany. That may be a hard nut to crack, but we certainly, many of us here have a very strong influence on what happens in especially German studies classrooms in this country. Um, so many of the people who have been active scholars of black German studies have also been in the forefront of integrating black German topics into their classrooms. And now other instructors are looking to them, I guess to us, for guidance in how best to teach black German studies, what strategies we've, we've employed, what problems we've encountered. So, we hope this roundtable will start or perhaps further an important discussion about how we can learn from each other to better teach our students about black German topics. Um, we're really fortunate that as you've heard, the participants in this roundtable bring very different perspectives to the discussion and the people in the, this on this round table, as many of you out there, have been in the forefront of forging the field of black German studies in the classroom as well as in scholarship. So as moderator, I ask our participants to think about a range of questions as they thought about their remarks, and I'd like to tell you what those questions are so that you can be thinking of them too as you're thinking about how you will contribute to the discussion. So here's some questions that maybe can frame how we proceed in the next two hours. 
Um, first, what are the similarities and differences in addressing black German topics in undergraduate and in graduate classrooms? How should we think and talk about issues of racial identity in the black German studies classroom? How can we efficiently provide students with the analytical skills they need to understand the black German experience? How can we effectively address black German topics in courses that enroll both minority students who contend daily with assumptions about the meaning of race and white students who may have thought very little about the meaning of race? How can we encourage students to recognize similarities and differences in definitions of blackness and race in the United States and Germany? I think that's a particularly big challenge because I suppose if you're 18 or 20, it's sort of, you sort of think, oh yes, I know about this, this is, but of course they don't because they don't understand the whole different context of coming out of Germany. How can we teach students to understand race as a socially constructed and historically inflected category? How can we teach students to think intersectionally regarding race as only one of a number of categories that construct identity? How can we encourage students to probe the utility of notions of whiteness in Germany as well as in the US? How can we deal productively with emotional reactions like anger, denial, resistance, guilt, and defensiveness in the classroom? How can we advocate in our programs and throughout our institutions for the importance of addressing issues of race, not just in courses that focus directly on black German or other minority issues? So how can, how can race become a critical category in everything that, in, in all scholarship, in all teaching? And finally, how can we make the convincing case to all scholars and teachers of German studies that until they include a focus on the experience of black Germans and other racialized peoples in Germany, until they acknowledge the importance of race as an analytic category for understanding Germany, their own research and teaching will remain flawed and incomplete. So now I'm going to turn um, our discussion over to our panelists, and um, I'm really excited to hear what they have to tell us. Thank you. Do you I think have a running order? I can, well, the running order was Priscilla first, but right, exactly. that's yeah. not going to happen. So the next is, uh, the next is Peggy, I think. Um, okay, well. <laughs> Um, thank you, Sarah, for this great introduction and a variety of questions where I'm not very sure if we can address all of them. Um, this might be a little shaky because, yeah, as Sarah said, uh, the idea was that Priscilla is uh, uh, um, starting off and since this was already also her own idea, her own concept, she has actually a very nice introduction. We all read that, but it's not here now. <laughs> So keep in mind there is an introduction to the concept of this whole panel coming later. You know? So for those of you who are doing writing, um, academic or uh, uh, also um, uh, uh, creative writing, you know you're always coming back to the introduction at the end. So that's what we're going to do. So. Um, yeah, I, I'm not sure if I can address all of the questions. Um, I structured my... Um, uh, short remarks here in five major points which I want to address and um, I'll just tell them to you and then um, I will walk through the five points. Um, so my first point would be um, authenticity and introduction uh, uh, and uh, instruction in the classroom. So the notion of authenticity or the the twisted notion of authenticity. So it matters who is speaking, but in a very complex uh, uh, way. Um, and the second point which I want to address would be the quantitative approach or what makes a critical mass, which is also always an, an issue I'm running into when I'm teaching uh, uh, black German history. So uh, the problem of numbers. 
Um, the third point will be the national notions of race of, uh, and minorities uh, knowing histories in their plurality. So uh, what I call race is not all equal, and um, that's, I mean, it's, it's, it's actually an obvious, but that's something which we always have to address, um, teaching uh, uh, race, teaching um, the, uh, people of color minority studies in a different cultural setting. The fourth point would be um, Google your way in understanding anything. Um, <laughs> the burden of pop cultural representation, which I just run into this last um, semester when I saw when my students uh, prepared their uh, presentations. And um, it's amazing how you can read some YouTube clips, you know, how you, what you make of them. Um, and the last point I want to talk about briefly would be traveling concepts, notions, and um, self-representations. So diaspora studies uh, is welcomed home, and that would be maybe the journey back to Germany. So I want to talk a little bit about that. Um, but first, uh, on a personal, personal note, um, my black German experience here in the U.S. Uh, began actually in 2007 when I started out um, on, on a temporary position in uh, Vassar College in the German department. And when I came in, um, you know, you have this a new faculty orientation, you have to go through all kind of things. Um, and when you come from a uh, uh, different country, different cultural setting, so um, HR, human resources, and that, it's, it's all even a little bit more complicated. But what was really um, amazing and fascinating to me was that everybody would look at me and say, you know, there's another black German here. I can't, I can't believe that is really true. So, and it turned out that the director of um, HR um, uh, was a black German, um, lived there as an African American, who is one of the, uh, our sisters who got adopted um, in, the, uh, in the 1950s. And it really, it shaked whole Vassar because uh, for, for several reasons. I think um, first, um, I had the feeling that some of the people never really believed her story, you know. <laughs> And then this, this young black person with this strange accent came to Vassar and then they said, oh, there might be two of them, you know. <laughs> so, and for me, it was also um, my first introduction with um, my own history, but then on a personal level. Um, since I studied uh, uh, black German history, since I was familiar with Yara's book, um, I knew about this history, but I, n I didn't know people. So that was, that was an, an amazing personal moment when we met each other, and it was really, really funny when I went to the orientation on human resources, so I looked through, and then, of course, we also have our stereotypes, and I thought, uh, no, you are African-American, I can see that. Um, are you maybe? I don't know. And then Ruth later came to me and she told me that she basically screened the room in the same way, you know, like, <laughs> oh no, you're from Mississippi, but you could look like, you know, and it's not just the face, but it's of course all the, you know, this kind of, um, I was probably the, the one who was the most lost in the room, you know, what, what, what did you say right now, you know? So, and that's when she then came to me and said, you know, I think you must be Peggy. And I said, yes, and you must be Ruth. And that was just really just an amazing thing. So, so this is a little bit of personal background. Let me start out with um, authenticity and it matters who speaks. Um, um, I think one of the most important uh, questions for us always in German studies and certainly here in the US is how to bring race into uh, the classroom, not just when we have this unit on uh, racialized matters or on black German uh, history in, in a German classroom. Well, for me, it is so that race as a critical category is walking into the classroom with me all the time. So in, um, in, uh, in fall semester, I'll be teaching our senior seminar on, uh, on literature after uh, 1945, and that's not very heavily um, uh, uh, based on black German literature. I mean, we do canonial literature, you know, you've got to talk a little bit about uh, Günther Kuss, you know, you really do. 
Um, so, but it, race comes into the classroom once I walk into the classroom. Um, first and foremost, because immediately I break with, um, with a very general perception of Germanness equals whiteness um, and everything what we can read in Fatima El Tayyip's um, uh, uh, book and her essays uh, on German identity shaped uh, in the early 20th century. That is, I don't even have to say anything, I don't even have to address it, um, it already changed the discourse. Um, and that's, I think, it's an important part, not necessary for the best, but it already disturbs a notion of normalcy. Um, um, once we go get over that, oh, okay, German is not, doesn't equal whiteness, um, then I very often feel that um, I'm, I'm actually getting trapped in, an, in, a, in a different, and here she comes. <laughs> Welcome. Well. Welcome to your own panel. <laughs> I just keep talking a while and then you can, you know, just catch your breath and we can switch to you. Well, um, from my experience uh, teaching black German uh, topics here in the US, I always feel that at a certain point in the classroom, um, I feel trapped in this, in this twisted notion of authenticity that for some strange reasons, um, the discussion um, gets a little tainted um, because students expect, um, oh yeah, this is the authentic voice. Um, and that, of course, it's also, it becomes a burden on the non-white students in the classroom as well. So this is something which um, we need to keep in mind um, uh, by teaching uh, uh, non-white topics, that by white topics it is never be seen that um, either the instructor or the white student is now the authentic voice. I mean, it is implied, it is already <laughs> incorporated. Um, and what I try to address this by pointing exactly this out to, to what, what, what is the most important um, aspect for me is not just to defend um, the minority position of blackness or the defensive mode of blackness, but actually to, to question and to problematize um, the no notion of uh, underlying of authenticity or objectivity of the rest of it. So we are talking about uh, non, non black issue, for example, and we do not have this problem of authenticity or we are not running into questioning whether that is actually objective or not. Um, but yet we are hopping to, I don't know, hip hop and, and, or something else and we talked about the Prinzen before and we didn't do that. So I think that is very important to, um, what, what you always can do, um, to uh, problematize this underlying notion, which is actually the notion of authenticity, that everything um, coming from, from um, the hegemonic approach is actually already the objective. Um, my second point, I mean, I just throw out a couple of my own, uh, uh, um, um, well, thoughts and uh, uh, points of my experience, and then we can uh, um, come back to that in the discussion. Um, what makes a critical mass? Um, that is a question which is always um, pretty much the same in Germany and in the US. Um, I mean, the, the difference is when, when I, uh, one of us is um, giving a performance or an, uh, um, uh, uh, an academic lecture, um, the first question in Germany would be, um, did you experience that yourself? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So when, when I'm talking about uh, um, per perception of blackness in comics, um, they would ask me if I experienced that way myself. I'm not a comic uh, character. But that is immediately this, is this actually real racism? So that's the German obsession. The US obses obsession is, how many are you? <laughs> and with this irritating mode, like, 
okay, you know, which was a lot of question behind that. You know, you are the first one I ever saw. Is this really relevant? Um, what does this have to do with us? Um, you know, how many black soldiers were there to actually make you, you know? I mean, all of that is behind that, you know? Um, and I think that that is a problem. The way I'm addressing that is always there are two, two intellectual component, components which are important to me to bring across. This is um, one to say um, that, uh, uh, well, this whole critical mass is not the same like in the US. And you can, um, uh, uh, you can compare that with um, the 1920s, that basically the Jewish com uh, community was about 1% in, in, in Germany. And um, that did not um, prevent us from, from experiencing the 1930s and 40s and, and the Holocaust. So we need to ad address and approach this notion of um, a blackness, this notion of minority status and um, identity in Ger Germany uh, from a different angle than numbers. So even when I tell you it's a million or 10 millions, it doesn't, it, it doesn't say anything. It, it might make a difference in that you see in uh, Oberammergau a little bit more, but it does not make a difference in terms of really talking about German identity and all the problems with that. And the second part um, that we actually can't really answer this question uh, uh, good enough, um, because there are not no such thing than um, racialized statistics in, in Germany, and actually the European Union is still working on a framework to, um, to uh, a legal framework which would allow to um, come up with a, a racialized uh, a, a sensor. Um, um, uh, like, like in the US. Um, and there are, of course, uh, different uh, um, opinions on that. On the one hand, it would be um, uh, interesting and I think also necessary to get a more statistically um, based uh, uh, approach about people of color in, in Europe right now. I mean, we're talking all the time about Europe and, and whiteness and Europe and, and the, the uh, danger of the otherness. Let's have some numbers here. But on the other uh, hand, uh, there is a reason why we don't have that in Germany, right? so that you can't just uh, come up and, um, with statistic and say, you know, um, are you a brown person or uh, what would they do? Are you Jewish? Um, you, that's all where already um, the heart attack starts in Germany. Um, yeah, we have this very night with the uh, debate, I don't know if you followed that, um, on the circumcision, the, um, there's just a new uh, 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 court decision out, which of course was focusing and targeting um, the uh, Islamic practice and culture, and I, I, I just had, I almost fall out of my uh, shoes when I read this, because that was so, so typical of just looking like that and trying to approach the so-called problem of, of Islam and, and the radical Islam, and then the first thing you had as a response what came from the Jewish community, of course, because uh, circumcision is not just something which um, uh, uh, is a practice in, in uh, uh, Islam. Um, well, my, f my next point um, would be uh, Google your way in understanding anything with a question mark. Um, uh, the burden of pop cultural representation, and that is something where I also always see it's actually the, the biggest problem, what I have in, 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 in my classrooms, that students are, of course, much more savvy with um, a, a multimedia approach with the internet and coming up with um, pretty fancy presentations, and then they use some clips, and certainly when, when we teach that in English, and then a lot of the original material is actually not accessible to them. And then they come in with the what they just learned in history 250 uh, on the, the African-American experience uh, since 68 or something like that and come up with, oh, there is um, uh, 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 not enough protest or not enough, you know, outcry or, um, I, one uh, uh, example was here um, on racial profiling. Um, I uh, included this in my last uh, um, seminar. 
um, and made actually a an, an comparison. Um, or, uh, we, we discussed uh, two cases, um, the Trayvon Martin case um, here in Florida, which is still uh, uh, playing out, um, and the uh, also a new, um, um, still pretty new uh, court decision in Germany, which basically allows racial profiling for um, border control um, uh, officers um, because they are they are pressured on uh, of time, so it is uh, okay to um, uh, uh, stop and frisk on the basis on um, racial appearance. Um, and uh, that is, of course, a, a complex matter. But if you just um, Google some uh, uh, some statements, um, um, some video clips, some uh, YouTube. Uh, um, uh, 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 responses, uh, then, um, well, the larger context is missing, and I think that is something which will be uh, become a problem uh, even more in the in in the future, since um, nobody's reading anymore, but uh, everybody is rather going through the internet first. Um, and I think that um, the problem of lost in translation, which will uh, Noah uh, address uh, more in detail, is 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 be seen here in in uh, in in the most uh, urgent matter. So not not just in in a direct translation, like okay, you couldn't understand all the other words, but also this lost in a cultural translation that. Um, just to look into the hip hop uh, project of Berlin, Bronx, you don't really understand that. You need to go back to the 1980s and understand uh, black German hip hop. Um, and my last point, uh, traveling concepts, traveling notions, and self-representation. Um, that's an interesting point, I, um, I think, which um, uh, uh, um, we also should keep in mind, um, and that is the hegemonic differences within minority studies and within our own field of black German studies between the US and Germany. Um, so the, the majority, not just in, in numbers, but um, um, in, in a general uh, perception, the um, uh, hegemonic approach, the position of the objective within our framework is actually coming from here. So the US is the, is, is the place where academic concepts are developed. The US is the place where black history started. We all know it's not true, but yes. So. <laughs> the US is the place where if we talk about transnationalism, then we start out here. Um, and it is this place where diaspora is defined. And that brings, that, uh, brings a lot of problems and complications in, into the place. And when we look into um, specifically black German studies, um, Sarah already uh, um, uh, pointed that out and stressed this, that um, the beauty of this, of course, I'm, a, I'm I'm a little biased here. <laughs> I think the beauty of this studies is that it really started out um, by, by people who wanted to know their own history and which did not start in the universities, not in the academic field, but which, which really started with young people who um, were still pretty early in their own um, uh, higher education, if in higher education to begin with. Most of them in the 80s were in, the high, in high school, in late high school or early um, uh, college. And um, well, we all um, know and appreciate um, the importance of uh, showing our colors. We all talk about the late 80s and the uh, formation of the uh, uh, organizations and um, uh, uh, the, the black German movement. But what we don't see, and I think that's something where um, we as an academic discipline m might owe something to this movement to stress this more and also to, to work about that and uh, work on that and, and talk about that. Um, is this uh, transformation from an activist, activist perspective, from an activist place into an academic place into the international space? So basically it was the other way around. It came from, from Germany, it spread out to, to other European countries, I mean the black German studies, huh? I'm not talking about that we invented everything. 
and it came here to the US and um, people here, smart people, took that on and said, well, this is something we need to address with much more institutionalized power because of, of course, the positioning of blackness, positioning on, of African American history here in the US. It was not this kind of a strange thing to say, well, German studies should include also minority studies. While when at the same time we tried this in Germany and everybody was like, eh? Okay, and then, you know, my first four points would come into, you know, how many are you? Um, did you really experience that? And what is also a very classical uh, um, uh, first answer is, well, that's in the US, that's, has not, that's not our history. Yeah. So this traveling concept is actually not so much from that concepts of race came to Germany from the US. I mean, that is problematic because race is not every, everywhere the same. It's not so much that the idea of blackness came from the US to, to Germany. It's actually that it traveled, an activist idea, an activist approach of visibility traveled to the, through the, to the US with the help of um, people here in the uh, academia became an, a critical field, became a field which is worth to study. And what we see now since actually just a couple of years is that it somehow strangely comes back home to Germany that universities accepting that, finding that very interesting and say, oh yeah, we should do something about that. Um, there is um, a lot of, uh, of publications out and we should bring these people to campus. And interestingly, um, they invite people and they have to fly them back from, uh, from, from the US, from Britain, um, from the Netherlands, from everywhere. Um, and they had us back 10 years ago. And just a little footnote on that, um, uh, I was just involved in, in uh, one of the most recent developments in, in this, um, in, in, in this co uh, context that the University of Bayreuth um, received uh, 3 million uh, euros for, from the um, Department of Education to um, kick off an um, ins institution of uh, diaspora studies, um, which is pretty fancy right now there in Germany. And um, they reached out to work with us, to, to uh, co cooperate with, with us, and I felt kind of funny. I really thought this was, uh, um, it's interesting, you know, like it had to travel around and coming back home. And that's also not new when we look into the experience of um, Maya Eim, um, who actually got her first uh, uh, more uh, appreciation in the German media after she traveled to South Africa or the US and had um, uh, her first gigs here and after um, important people and here comes the notion also again of objectivity and you know like uh, oh they do really serious German studies and who invited her, who discussed her work after the first papers were presented then um, the German media thought oh that's maybe literature, that's maybe poetry, you know, let's feature that. Okay, I think that's all what I wanted to talk about. Um, when I thought about it, I really thought it would be 10 minutes, but it was more. <laughs> <laughs> but maybe we can shift now to Priscilla. Thanks. Priscilla, I wonder if, do you want to go next or do you still need to catch your breath? I can go. Okay. Um, okay. Yeah, I apologize for my tardiness, but I ended up on the complete opposite side of town. Uh, and I blame that on the fact that since I've been living in Chapel Hill, North Carolina, my big city skills have degraded. <laughs> and I'm uh, trying to, yeah, uh, get my bearings. But. Okay, thanks. Um, but I'll, I'll just get started um, while I wait for that. Um, so my observations are based on my experiences um, teaching at 
uh, the University of North Carolina in Chapel Hill, where I've been since uh, last fall, uh, 2011. Um, and it was my first time teaching in a classroom with only white students. Um, so that was uh, an interesting experience. Um, so uh, for me, being in German studies, um, I've noticed that you rarely see black Germans on the syllabus. Um, and you're more likely to see maybe Turkish German authors and directors um, than black Germans. Um, and if uh, black German culture is addressed, it's often in a historical context or political, uh, but not really in terms of uh, the cultural output of black Germans. Um, and the excuses that I've heard, and, and Peggy mentioned this, are the fact that there are low, low numbers of Afro-Germans um, compared to Turkish Germans, that Turkish Germans are just a lot more visible. Um, but to me, on the other hand, you know, you often see an author like Yoko Tawada, who's a Japanese German um, on syllabi, and there's not a, a lot of Japanese Germans uh, in Germany, but her work is seen as being um, stylistically creative in a way that transcends individual experience, and that's why uh, professors like to use her text. Um, and in my own personal experience as a grad student, um, when I wanted to recite a Mayayim poem um, in a seminar, I was dissuaded from doing that um, because I was told that you know, this would be essentialist and you know, if I would be putting myself in a box if I, as a black female, you know, did a poem by a black uh, female German. Um, but you know, I think you know, this is ridiculous. <laughs> um, and I believe you can definitely combine uh, discussions of individual experience and more universal issues um, in the classroom and in your research. Um, so I'd just like to talk about my experience with that at UNC. Um, now when I got to UNC, I had two main challenges um, in the classroom. Number one was, you know, how do you talk to students about issues like immigration and racial discrimination when they have never had that personal experience? Um, and also, how do I, as a black woman, uh, talk about you know, the intersection of, of racism and sexism uh, to a white classroom in a way that doesn't make them feel like their opinions aren't you know, important or their experiences aren't important. Um, and I was actually warned by a colleague you know, that the way that I phrase something or, or just the way that I title my courses <laughs> could kind of scare students away. Like I wanted to name one course um, the dialectic of blackness and whiteness and I was told no call it race in Atlantic cultures. <laughs> so it's, it's a, a slippery slope. Um, so the first experience I'd like to share is um, last fall, uh, I taught a class called Modern German Society. Um, and I was told to start the class off with a discussion of how students identify themselves, to kind of talk about the different kinds of identifications and categories in Germany. Um, and I found that this was actually a really interesting exercise because it put the ball in the students' court. So they could say, how do they identify? How much information about themselves do they want to give? Um, so if a student said, you know, he's an American Catholic male, you know, I'd write it on the board and we would break it down. Like, okay, American is a nationality, Catholic is a religion, male is gender. Um, and then I was surprised when I had one student who said he's a, he's a white male. So, you know, the students were like, okay, white, that's race, that's Lhasa. You know, and that gave me the opportunity to talk about, you know, this, the difference between Rasa in Germany and race in the U.S. and the fact that you don't use Rasa, you know, after 1945 in Germany. Um, and I think the fact for them trying to think about, you know, race as a construct and how it can exist in one context and not in the other was really helpful for them. Um, let's see. Um, for some other examples, um, other ways I try to include black German culture in the classroom is to contextualize it in a way um, that shows that the issues that affect black Germans can be very, you know, dependent on time and place, but they can also be universal issues that you find throughout German culture. Um, so, you know, if I talk about uh, group identity and exclusion, like I like to start with Franz Kafka, a short story of his, because, you know, he's one of the respected, you know, names in German literature. Um, and then I work my way to hip hop, because <laughs> I like to work on popular culture, but sometimes you, know, you have to give it a little bit more context so people you know, respect the work that you're doing. Um, so this Kafka story that I use called Fellowship is basically about the arbitrariness of group identity. Um, so in a nutshell, 
uh, five friends walk out of a house, one after the other, and everyone else looks at them and says, you're a group. And then a sixth person comes and wants to join them, and they say, no, we're already a group. We don't want a sixth person. Um, so when I do this story with students, you know, I ask them, what defines this group? What, what holds them together? Why won't they accept a sixth person? And I find it really helps them to think about you know, not just group identity, but national identity. Like, how do we define ourselves? Um, and then, you know, I'll play an excerpt of Advanced Chemistry's Flem de Magen and Lan um, from 92, um, talking about, you know, the violence that erupted after German reunification. Um, so when the Afro, one Afro-German rapper says he has a German passport, but no one will accept him as German, you know, we can talk about that in a larger context of um, different groups that have been ex excluded in German-speaking societies over time. Um, no, skip over flair <laughs> for sake of time. Um, so another way that I try to bring in black Germans in, into the classroom is, um, so when, when I taught Introduction to German Literature uh, last uh, spring semester, the first day of class I started with this slide to try to show students from the get-go now, the German literature is not just Goethe, you know, it's also Maya Yim, it's uh, Amina Ustamar. So, you know, there are minority authors in German literature, women. You know, so I try to highlight the variety of voices you hear in German literature. Um, and in my lesson on Maya Yim, um, I actually started students off with this activity um, where they had to plug in verbs. Um, so it's, it's about Maya Yim's bio biography, but I framed it in a way that because it's a grammar exercise, I didn't want it to be about me lecturing to students about you know, black German history. Um, they kind of learned about it through doing the grammar. Um, and actually, you know, students uh, it kind of generated some questions among students. Like one student asked me, you know, why did she live in a children's home? And that led me to you know, talk about uh, after World War II and, and the American occupation and, and a little bit more about black German history. So I just want to talk about some of the poems that I discussed with the students and their responses. Um, so one of the poems I did was uh, Aflo Deutsch, which is a dialogue between a black German woman and a white German woman, but you only hear the voice of the white German. Um, and it, it was a great text to, to get at inter, uh, intersectionality um, as well, because the white German woman um, kind of suggests that because they're both women that she can understand what it's like to be discriminated against because of sexism. But she clearly has you know, racist views herself, even though she doesn't notice it. Um, so like some of the you know, questions I asked students were, you know, why don't we hear anything from the Afro-German? And, and this is a technique, this is a literary technique that Maya Yim is using. So in this way, you know, we're not just talking about politics and history, we're also talking about stylistics. Um, so, you know, the students had really interesting ideas saying that, you know, we don't hear the Afro-German because the white German doesn't care what she thinks, you know, or maybe the Afro-German doesn't want to engage in this ignorant conversation. Um, so I was really um, uh, struck by, yeah, the, the creativity, creative answers that the students gave. Um, I was also able to ask questions like, how is Germanness defined by this poem? So that students can think about the fact that German identity is a construct and really depends on the context. So some said, you know, here in this poem, to be German is to be white, uh, privileged, to have a good upbringing. Um, another one said it's, it's to share a shameful past, you know, that no one else has. Um, another poem I did with them was um, Deutschland im Herbst, uh, which compares um, Kristallnacht in 1938 with uh, German reunification and the violence that happened then. Um, and again, stylistically, this poem is interesting because Maya Yim uses a lot of um, ambiguous words. So she says, he, she, it. Um, it's very vague. So I asked students, you know, what, what is the meaning of this? And you know, they said, well, it's to show that um, anybody can be discriminated against or that this is a problem that it's not just a German problem or from a certain time, but it can happen at any time and anywhere. Um, and also, we, earlier in the semester, we had read um, Heine Kaini's, Heine's uh, Germany, A Winter Tale. So, you know, I was able to talk about kind of the metaphor of the season um, in both of these poems and what, what is the meaning of that and also what similarities can we find between this poem written by a, a, a Jewish German author in the 19th century and an Afro-German author in the 20th century. 
Um, so the last poem that I discussed with students is Exotic, which is basically a collection of um, German idioms with the word black in them, and they're all negative. Um, and students really picked up on this, um, that you know, associa associations with blackness in German tend to be negative. Um, so I followed this up with this handout, which I got from ALF, Allerlernen, or ALD, Allerlernen Deutsch, thank you, um, where they had to kind of find the, the English equivalent to the German idiom. Um, so this also showed that, you know, in, in a lot of the English equivalents, there is no mention of blackness, but in the German, it's, it's always present. Um, so the last activity that I found really interesting was, um, as a creative writing group activity, I had them occupy the role, or kind of step into the shoes of the Afro-German woman and write her response um, that's missing in the poem, um, just to, to have them role play and think about, you know, what she might say to this German woman's um, comments. Um, so that's, that's all I have. Um, just, I guess, as a follow-up, my, my plans for the future um, in terms of, of bringing black German culture into the classroom are um, in the spring I'm teaching a course on rebellion and recognition, and I intend to teach about the Haitian Revolution uh, with uh, Heinrich von Kleist's play, uh, The Betrothal in St. Domingo. And I'd also really love to teach a class called Wer hat Angst vorm Schwarzen Mann? <laughs> about uh, the constructions of blackness throughout German history. Although we'll see if my colleagues are okay with that title. It might <laughs> frighten the students. But anyway, okay, thank you. similarities in this uh, analysis of what we'd like to talk about today. Um, yeah, I, I hardly um, ever teach uh, very young people, uh, students. Um, it's more, more grown-up people and um, who, of course, already know everything. And um, more on an in informal level. So I get together on panels like these. I'm, I'm not a... Um, a teacher in a, in, a, in a set environment. I just do um, lectures or presentations, one-offs, so I don't get to, to, to be with the people as a teacher for a long time. Um, so this is why I can only um, talk about the questions um, as much as that I believe that in order to um, be able to teach your students right, I think you need to know what's going on yourself first. And um, so I'm all about educating the people who might be teachers on some level. And um, that also has a lot to do with authenticity. Um, my authenticity focus here is, is a slightly different one. Um, it is um, about the... Um, common North American misconceptions about black Germany. So I'm still at the stage where um, I need to claim our authenticity. Um, first of all, so you know where, where I'm coming from. I am a German both born and raised in Bavaria. And I've been studying my country for a while. Um, and I've been frequently working in the United States since 1995 commuting and I lived in New York City from 2002 to 2005. Um, and I analyze and, and, and try, to, try to structure and explain the way that um, also um, what Peggy says, um, a hegemonic structure um, works, how um, power structures are being established and negotiated, passed on and communicated through words and through actions in our societies. So regarding those power structures, when we talk about um, black Germany and uh, black America, then black America, as you already said and explained, holds the, the dominant position. This works just like in uh, any other relationship in which power structures are present. And the result of this privilege is that black America's statements and conclusions about black Germany will reach a wider audience than those of black Germany itself. 
and um, America's opinions and statements on us are so much, like, more, much more likely to be discussed, considered, believed, rewarded than our own statements on our own issues. To the world, the United States has the Deutungshoheit, we say, um, well, not power of, power of definition, exactly. Like, not really, but it, you know, to the world it looks like it had. This means the last word on interpreting and uh, judging our own affairs is um, once more on somebody else. And out of this special relationship results a special responsibility. Um, and I'm really happy that Tina said, um, and I really appreciate that uh, she said there's the um, Bereitschaft to, to practice the art of listening. Um, um, because um, I'd say the black United States has and needs to acknowledge um, this responsibility in dealing with most Afro-diasporic societies or studies, not just the Germans. Um, the world just rather listens to what you say about us than to what we ourselves have to say. Um, this Deutungshoheit uh, and this power position does not necessarily result from a deeper knowledge uh, as of course the Afro-Germans know a thing or two about um, Afro-Deutschland. And um, it is um, just the fact, especially when we think of other fields of power structures or hegemonic constructs that we know, then we know that power is not necessarily a result of more knowledge. Uh, it can stem from different reasons, solely from historic events for example, from tradition as well, among other factors. So in my work um, on indications of dominant uh, discourse, I can explain in a little more detail why it is that the member of the discussed and non-dominant group usually has an advantage in knowledge compared to the other person, to the non-member of discussed but member of dominant group, but can often not cash in on this advantage of knowledge. Uh, there mm -hmm. won't be time for all this background theories now. You'll just have to, I don't know, believe me or, <laughs> or not, or, or apply intersectionality, what you already know about how power structures work um, in, in other fields, how they affect our everyday interactions and universal relationships. Who's the one talking? Who's getting heard? And about whom do they talk? In which way? Who's being asked their opinions in the first place? Uh, whose opinion is being regarded as objective and whose isn't, who is doing most of the research and who gets the credit for it. Who can get away with not giving proper credit to who has done which other original work and who cannot get away with that. Just apply these questions to every other power structure or hegemonic structure you know of in uh, our societies and uh, then I'm sure that one or the other um, will come to your mind. The black US and um, Deutsche shared history is also a divided history. It is a geteilte Geschichte. And it's complicated, complex, and continuing to be so. But in every double consciousness lies a huge advantage, I think. We can choose to embrace it. And by learning about our sisters abroad, of course, we also learn as much about ourselves. Um, and um, I just want to raise awareness as much as I can for the fact that this does not translate as we'll show you how it's done. And Afro-Deutschland and the US were lucky to interact, to form a vivid exchange with activists and um, people who understood just that and who did not have an ethnologist's approach. With my work, I, I would like to help ensure that our conversation will purposely take place on eye level, that this is on our agendas especially the United States one, holding a, a power position here, and um, that everybody uses their personal or society's privileges wisely. Um, as I said last year, you can get a degree by writing my history, uh, should you choose to do that. And here are a few cultural translation areas. These are only um, a brief excerpt of a larger Vortrag and work um, and, and the thing I'm writing right now. A few cultural translation errors that are common and I think should be avoided at all costs. I will be using both the terms Afro-Deutsche and Black Germans because I think Afro-Germans is something different from Afro-Deutsch. 
and I do not like to use it that much at a German conference. Okay, cultural cluelessness error number one, in random order. <laughs> there are no black Germans, and if there are black Germans, there are only a few. So of course, this is ridiculous. We, as we are at a black German conference, we all know better. But um, I learned the hard way, and it is really puzzling to me how this can be at the same time. I cannot expect people to see many black Germans and simultaneously realize that many black Germans exist. Like the human brain is an interesting thing sometimes. <laughs> One of the most hurtful for me modern classics of this version is the American tourist who comes to Berlin in order to experience him or herself and Europe and deny the black German presence uh, even though we're all over the place. Countless visitors, even long-term visitors, succeed in doing so. And um, I had a young black American musician tell me that she doesn't hang out with black people in Germany because there hardly aren't any black people in Germany. She was um, in Berlin to sing songs to fight white supremacy. <clears throat> I also would have, I, I would have hoped this to remain an anecdote. You know, but it isn't quite so. There is a pattern behind it. I experienced this um, quite frequently and have been for a long time. Um, it is it's this, this going to Europe in order to find a white experience or going for the white experience in Europe because this is what, what Europe is expected to be and then zoning out Europe's black uh, presence or other uh, marginalized or racialized groups presence. Another cultural translation error might be Afro-Deutsche are a little research subject. So yeah, we're many, and we research ourselves quite thoroughly. That um, the, our expertise or our results are not being heard everywhere, and uh, or maybe our results and voices are not being considered or widespread known to you, or the main part of the colloquium as much, isn't because we ain't researched and researching, it is because we hold the marginalized position in our own country, and also in the subject that studies us in our own country. Afro-Deutsche are a comparably new and interesting phenomenon. Okay, we're interesting, all right. <laughs> um, I give you that. But we sure ain't new. Again, um, you know, Anton Wilhelm Amo delivered this paper on the jurisdiction of black Europeans in 1729 when he was a scholar at the university in Halle, if you want to call that young. And um, all the people we know of before him. So I, I really have no clue why. I, actually, I, I have a clue. It is probably due to Wunschdenken, why this uh, cultural translation error prevails. Um, Afro-Deutsche is a race that is other than black. I don't think so. <laughs> the term Afro-Deutsche was starting to get used by Afro-Deutsche around 30 years ago in order to name a common experience, that of being black while being German. Later, it was acknowledged that one does not have to be German necessarily in order to make most of the experiences we're talking about. Like Afro-Deutsch can be who is black permanently living in Germany or having been socialized in Germany or by German folks or born in Germany. It still does not have a cultural meaning outside of being born and or raised in Germany, living there, being socialized um, there uh, while being black. Neither does Afro-Deutsch imply a certain set of nationalities of the parents, nor a type of upbringing or uh, a, a skin color mixed situation of some DNA parents thing or um, this, this, this race that, um, Priscilla, I'm, I'm glad you mentioned it, that anybody who's listening from Germany, don't you dare translate race as Rasse. <laughs> this would be a Übersetzungsfehler. Uh, it's, it's a different concept. And, in, in uh, both our cultures. Um, so Afro-Deutsche is, uh, is, is not this, um, this stereotype that many, many people think it is. Um, parents can be both from Ghana, from Germany, or from Canada, or one or the other from some other place. Afro-Deutsche is a shared experience. It's a place in history and presence, 
And now out of this, of course, did grow a culture, but that's a different thing. Leading to the next cultural translation era, Afro-Deutsche are a homogenous group, and you can tell who it is by looking around uh, a room. Um, involving people with one white German parent is usually the stereotype, and all the other black people in Germany would be immigrants then from Africa who are not Afro-Deutsche. And um, this is also wrong, some Afro-Deutsche were born in Germany, some have migration or refugee experience immediately so or in their family, some are fifth generation black Germans, some have citizenship since last week. You find every class, every religion, persuasion, so on. So, um, of course, if the Afro-Deutsche you talk to are all intellectuals or academics, then there's a tendency to not consider certain other people Afro-Deutsche. And so they are not being filed under this label by the viewer on look at us, don't get, you know, there, there doesn't, there's no dialogue starting about the, these subjects. Then of course, one might get the idea of Afro-Deutsche as a similar looking or homogenous group of people. Afro-Deutsch means identity crisis. This is a favorite one in like recent pop literature and uh, poems and um, art. Um, I think this is beneath the point. We do have issues. We, have a mar we are marginalized in our own country, in our societies. We are considered still to this day since uh, this advanced chemistry hip-hop song, which you saw from the 1980s, hasn't changed so much. Uh, foreigners uh, in our own country, and our human rights and uh, needs are not being equally considered by the majority. And in the 1970s and 80s, women had to fight, as Peggy said, for decades to even be allowed to write papers about the fact that we exist uh, at university. So yeah, there, there's issues. But those issues are not because of our identity, but they actually come from the other place, from the denial of our ex existence. So we do not have these issues. You know, the, the, the other Germans have issues with their national construct of Volkszugehörigkeit and the still very present, deeply rooted white fear and conviction Germans must not be black, black people must not, cannot be German. So yeah, Germany has identity issues, and we are being made to deal with them. This is something completely different from us having an identity issue. Uh, there is less segregation in Germany, therefore less or fewer racism. This is a classic that I hear all the time, that many people who spent less than, say, two or three years in Germany get all wrong unless um, you don't understand the codes. You cannot understand the culture. Segregation is a code that means something entirely different in our culture than it means in the, in, in the American, North American, United States culture. One cannot just take a code from one's own, own culture and apply it to the next and come to a correct uh, conclusion. Um, Germany's version of segregation in World War II was to kill everybody who was an Aryan from the absence of segregation as you know it from the United States up until the 1950s and 60s or still in some neighborhoods, you cannot come to the conclusion that black people in Germany have or had access to the same education or resources or opportunities as white people in Germany just because they are allowed in the same room together. Let me put it in a, in a provocative way like by looking at the reverse. If you grew up the only black kid in an entirely white neighborhood in a country that is by large denying uh, your existence and racism and not dealing with either, and you didn't have any black scholars or teachers or elders or friends, role models, encouragement, help around you, uh, would you still think this place is so nice because it's not segregated? This is how some black kids in Germany still grow up to this day, and um, our segregation works differently. It is less mm, visible to the outsider and um, also to the insider. And some find it even harder to deal with because as it is more subtle, it is harder to put your finger on it, some, some find, including myself. Um, it is very real, but um, 
the threat that is hidden is of course a bit harder to fight against. You have to, you know, defend first the fact that there um, is a segregation going on underneath. If black Germans would only organize themselves or do more lobbying, they could uh, become more powerful and reach equal rights and many other good things. It's another cultural translation error. I had this question literally two weeks ago at a panel in Berlin. Why don't you get organized? Why don't you form alliances? Why don't you all get in power positions and do some lobbying? <laughs> Kid from America asked a table of scholars and artists twice her age. It's like, sweetheart, we're German, we invented organizing. <laughs> <laughs> the, the issue here being absolutely not that we're not organized. <laughs> um, once again, here we have an assumption and a suggestion that is being based on the culture of the person speaking and not on knowledge about how Germany works. We are not yet there. We are not at the, the point, and by we I mean the country not uh, the Afro-Deutsche. When uh, we are not yet at the point where Deutschland thinks it has to consider us, you know, acknowledge our presence and, and history as a minority that has a name and uh, needs or let alone a right to programs that actually actively promote equal rights and chances. A German politician has yet to say the word Afro-Deutsche in public. <laughs> yet to acknowledge our existence, or as a group, or a deaths by Nazis, or the entanglement with Germany's colonial history, or our struggle to be acknowledged, accepted as a part of our own country. You cannot compare the black German situation and position to the black American situation and position at this moment. Everybody knows that black Americans exist. Now let me give you a short, final elevator pitch of a proposal that I'm working on. I'd like it to become a, a, a global diasporic community project eventually. Girl can dream. Um, it is, um, I, I would like to come up um, with the help of, of many colleagues with um, something like a, a table of best practice. Terms we can all agree on that make sure that our research is for the best and does not exclude or cover up or marginalize the voices of the subjects of study. This, um, I think, should be so in, in any research about humans uh, and in any research which would like to present valid results. And I think we can systematize this. I'm so German. <laughs> um, I have ideas to promote research on eye level um, by kind of like a code of conduct or best practice. And I'd like to start to introduce them along with a crossover project for research and speci specializations, a database that I understand is um, actually in, in the making by the Black German Cultural Society um, to, you know, what they say here, develop new and strengthen existing cooperative partnerships with organizations and uh, promote scholarships. And um, I think this would be the, the, the perfect start for something like this. I firmly believe that only when we become intersectional and those are just the first few baby steps toward this goal, then our research will be really valuable and, and valid for a long time for a lot of people and not just for some. <laughs> Plus, um, it can be a healing experience of mutual respect and professionalism that has the potential to set an example also for many more and, and completely other fields of work and research uh, around several Fachgebiete, countries, groups, whenever, and uh, because what, what is being studied are cultures, societies, countries, as human beings, so thank you very much. I think maybe we'll go directly to the response from the audience and then if our panel participants want to jump in and comment on each other's presentations, they can do that in the responses to your contributions. So I'd love to hear what you all have to say. Yes. Uh, guten Tag, my name is Nelson. I spent uh, six years in the military in 
Germany in the 80s. Uh, I had no experience with the Afro-Deutsch system there. But as I'm thinking, I realized that I had a first grade friend who I found out was of German descent, African-American German descent. And while I was in the military, I also had a friend who was, uh, I didn't realize it, one Thanksgiving he took me to uh, his parents in Frankfurt. And I had no idea that his mother was German, his father was African-American. And as I'm listening to everyone speak, I'm, I'm just surprised that we never had any discussion, my friend and I, and I've since lost contact with him. But aside from that, what I want to ask is, is there any difference between, say, the African-American Deutsch versus, say, the African Deutsch? <laughs> if there's such a thing. <laughs> I'm not so fast. <laughs> I think I have a response, but I would need a minute. <laughs> okay. Let, I don't have a chat lag. Like. Um, well, I think that's, that's the, the main, or that is one of our main questions for us, to understand each other better and also to strengthen what we want to do to um, develop and to represent our own field and our own community as uh, um, black people from Germany, if we want to include it this way, like um, uh, uh, um, uh, uh, black people being um, adopted um, and uh, grew up in, in, in the US or um, in, in, in Germany. Um, well, I like to respond with an, um, uh, uh, an anecdote which just happened to me uh, three weeks ago when um, two of my friends um, came and visited me, in, and I was in Poughkeepsie um, visiting uh, my black German friend who grew up being African American. And we had a wonderful dinner all together, and we talked about, um, well, our, basically our lives. And um, my friend from, from, from Germany, from East Germany to also a uh, um, black German, and she said um, that she found this an amazing meeting to, she, she, she's my generation as well, and, 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 and she said, well, this is basically, th this is our, our uh, uh, older generation, this is our black Germany which we never had. And coming together um, uh, 20, 30 years later, it makes her wonder what, what would happen if we would have grown up with, with all our sisters and brothers who were born in the 50s, um, in, the, in the 40s and in the 50s. And I think that is something of um, a shared experience um, also in, in, in this way, which we didn't have. So um, to think about uh, what would have been if we not just simply be all together in Germany with this emphasis on Germany, um, that might not be the most important part, but th uh, thinking about what we share in absentee that meaning an, a whole a, a generation being basically shipped to another country also meant that the generation coming after that grew up without them. Um, meaning with, when I grew up um, in the 70s, okay, we have a little obstacle here, it was in East Germany, but still, if we just think about, you know, um, I would have seen people who were 10, 15 years older than me, I would have seen people somewhere in, an, in a bank at a counter, in, um, uh, uh, in a library, um, in, uh, in, in a hospital, everywhere, you know, in, in this way. And I'm not talking numbers, I just talk uh, about um, uh, uh, this experience. And this is, if we keep that in mind, this is not just an enrichment in our shared history, but also I think what often uh, divides us is um, that it seems, and it, it's, I think it's just superficially, that we have different interests that the people in, in Germany, they are more interested in you know, getting organized, still doing organization, still bringing out you know, visibility, and yes, we are black and German, and um, you know, developing all black Germany, and then our brothers and sisters coming from, from, from the US, and it seems 
um, just superficially or on, in the first instant, they are more interested in Germany. And we like, oh God, Germany, <laughs> you know. And I think, I don't think it's really true, but very often I think we talk like that. And we, if we might keep both that in mind, you know, that maybe a little bit from my brothers and sisters from the US, you know, like, oh yeah, this is also meaning black Germany. And even, yeah, if you look for your roots in the 50s, you won't find me. I wasn't there. But having this in mind, like, what does this mean for all of us, for our shared history, that once I was shipped over, it also did something to you. It made for you who wasn't even there, me not being there for you. And I find this really, really important. And this one dinner night, it was so, it was amazing. I was a little nervous, you know, there were two friends of, from, from, from East Germany, and uh, my friend uh, in Poughkeepsie didn't know her, them, and I thought, well, let's all get together and just share our history, but I had no idea what that means. And it was really, it was this very emotional and, and deep connection about this, wow, this is basically you telling me my story, not as, you know, I'm telling you from my African-American experience, but just from uh, my couple of years in Germany and this long period of absentee, and um, the other way, what happened when I wasn't there. So mm -hmm. I think that is where we can approach our differences which superficially would be language, cultural embattenment, and with all of that, I mean, we all raised, we are all raised in a, a, a white dominant uh, education system. So we in Germany didn't learn a lot about African American history. <laughs> you didn't learn anything about us. <laughs> so we could approach it from this way or from what I just talked about. Yes. Um, here in the United States, there's an old saying, uh, it's, it's, uh, if you're white, you're right. If you're brown, stick around. If you're black, step back. I'm curious to know if uh, lighter-skinned blacks in Germany have an advantage over darker-skinned uh, Germans. Um, I, I think light skin privilege is worldwide. <laughs> Pretty much it. <laughs> can you repeat that? You got it. Oh, why can you not understand me? We I'm sorry. I, I think the light, lighter skin privilege is worldwide, and um, of course Germany is, is no exclusion. I, I don't think any country is a is an exclusion. Yeah. Uh, Oh, um, I wanted to respond to something that Noah said. Um, that, that was a really, rel really one of the many interesting points that you made um, when you talked about um, African Americans um, going to Germany and wanting to have a white experience. Mm -hmm. um, and I think, you know, I recognize that as an issue, and I, I, I'd like to to change it. I'm, I'm not sure how, but I thought I would share my own experience, you know, as a as an exchange student in Germany to shed some light on some of the issues. Um, so when I went to Germany um, as an exchange student, as a junior in college uh, in 2001, um, I had never heard of, of Afro Deutsch, of, of black Germans, until I got there and I saw them. Um, and, you know, I was curious, but, you know, part of me, I didn't want to just go up to them, you know, on the street. You know, how do you start that conversation? Um, and then another excuse of mine was that, you know, where I was hanging out, I was actually hanging out um, in the punk scene a lot, and there wasn't a lot of, you know, Afro Deutsche. There, there. there were some. <laughs> I, I didn't meet you, um, but I do remember, you know, being at one concert one night, and there was an Afro, uh, Afro German or Black German girl, and one of my friends said, "Oh, you know, she, her father's Jamaican. You know, my father happens to be Jamaican too." So, you know, I go up to her and I say, hey, I hear your father's Jamaican, so is mine, you know, which is a really awkward way to start a conversation, which I realize now, you know, maybe I should have said, oh, do you come here often, or do you know this band or something, but, but that's one of those moments where it's like, how, how do you make the first contact, you know, in a way that's not essentializing, that's not you're black and I want to talk to you, you know, for yeah. that reason, because yeah. it's more than that. But I just didn't know how to start the conversation. 
Um, but then on another occasion, when I was at the university, um, an uh, Afro-Deutsch girl gave me a flyer for Adafla, for this um, black German um, feminist group. And I was like, wow, you know, this is exciting, you know. And I also felt uh, recognized, you know, as you know, another black woman uh, who might be interested in that. And I went to the meeting, um, but then I felt, you know, really privileged. Like all of a sudden, I felt my Americanness, you know, because mm -hmm. I'm I was listening to these um, black German women talking about, you know, problems at work, discrimination, day-to-day -day stuff, and I felt like, whoa, I'm this, you know, privileged American college student who, you know, is just here for a short time, you know, and I came here to have fun, you know, and see Brandenburg Gate and things like that. And it's like, I could relate to their experiences, but I almost didn't, you know, didn't feel like I, you know, should say anything. Or, and I think, yeah, those two issues, privilege and essentialization are, are some of the hurdles to get over to, to bridge that gap when African Americans go to Germany. Lots of questions now. Um, um, but you did wind up here, so you were successful. I, I, you know. I made my way here <laughs> somehow. Possible. I, I can't exactly, I don't exactly know. It's, it's, um, my perspective, Jen. Yes, please. I just wanted to, to point up something that has come up and Noah approached it in the suggestion of something that's near and dear to my heart, and that is what I call and what we bandy about as the term intercultural competence, when she said it is about our educating ourselves. And the example just given by uh, Priscilla uh, points up the fact that it, there is a need because what she's describing is something that's very essential to uh, intercultural competence training, and that is critical incidents. What happens? If, what happens when? What do I do, what do I say, how do I respond? What's okay, what's not okay? And since we're talking about the topic of teaching experiences um, and how we go about teaching, some of us have, in ALD and others have been doing that quite, for quite some time in mixed and um, uh, for mixed students. And one of the things that, that often is very important is this whole notion of taking time to listen. Uh, taking time to pay attention and the classroom being a place where students can take the risk of asking some of what they might consider the dumb questions and I always say they're none of those they're just the, the informed quest uh, in uninformed questions so I think it's really important for us to consider that this is an area that never gets old in terms of our responsibility as educators as faculty advisors as um, just basic travelers that we really do need to educate ourselves and first before we even attempt to talk to our students about their experiences to come. Um, I don't quite have the order, so I'm just gonna go left to right. Good morning, uh, my name is Sira Diggs and I teach at Howard University in Washington, D.C. Um, I remember telling my students that this was the, on my first day there that this was the first time that I was not the only black person in a German classroom <laughs> in my context. Um, so I come, um, I have a question. Um, I'd, I'd like to also address this, this, um, this idea of privilege. Um, you speak that you say that an African Americans are in a, um, have a pr privileged voice as far as, um, I guess re representing the experiences of Afro-Germans. Um, li listening to Priscilla, I remembered being in Germany as an exchange su student, and I was sort of on the fence, because although I am an American citizen, I am originally from Liberia. And so when I landed in, in Tübingen, I uh, landed among Africans. And so in that circumstance, Afro-Germans have a privileged uh, voice yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. compared to, to, to us. And I remember we would um, cross or pass each other on the street. And one of the first things I heard was that, how do you know the difference between an Afro-German and an African? When you walk down the street, if you nod and they nod back, they're from Africa. If they oh, walk no, right no, past no, you. No, 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 no. No, I, let, let me finish. Oh, hell no. No, let, let me finish. That, that's what I was told, but I quickly, I, I experienced differently. 
I did experience it di di differently, but I did perceive that there was that sort of division there and a sense of, by at least a number of Africans there, of being sort of uh, looked down upon. Uh, but again, uh, we come to, to what you were saying, that it's our responsibility to um, ed educate ourselves and to get to know, because I did get to know Afro-Germans in, in, in Tübingen unlike some, who, some who, who had been there for many years. My question is this, um, speaking about, I, I was looking at that uh, sheet that, that you use in your classroom uh, from uh, Alle uh, Lernen in Deutsch. Um, how do we um, represent the experiences of Afro-Germans um, without um, running the, 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 the risk of presenting a very narrow uh, uh, on, and, and, and limiting uh, a, an image, N narrowing their experiences to just the confrontation of, 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 of racism. Um, 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 because I think that there's, there's a certain da danger there. And in, in my context, it's a more urgent question because um, if all my students hear about is, oh, you know, racism, racism, ra racism. How do I get my? How do, how do I get students to learn German? At you know, at Howard. Why bother? You know, um, that's the the uh, the. Um, so that's my question. The the balance there. How do we teach this without just limiting, uh, uh, pre presenting a very li limited experience? So thank you very much. Does the panel want to respond to that? Um. Well. Uh, from my experience of uh, teaching German, I, I, I've taught in high school as well and you know, seen a lot of different textbooks. I did see one textbook once that, you know, it followed a group of friends throughout the activities. And one of the friends was, um, was Afro-German. Um, and so it was very natural, you know, because in each chapter you learned about, you know, the, the friends and it wasn't unusual. Um, and then when I was a grad student, I taught with a book where the only time that um, Afro-Germans came up was the chapter that was about discrimination and like unemployment and everything that was negative, basically. It was an awful chapter. Um, so for me, as far as, as like a textbook would go, I definitely prefer the first example because um, I think it's best, you know, to just integrate, you know, the Afro-German experience throughout everything and not just, you know, have it in the problem chapter. Um, but yeah, if otherwise teaching at college, I mean, I have to admit a lot of the texts that we end up using focus on racism, like, like the film Schwarzfall, which I love, you know, but again, you know, it's about discrimination. Um, uh, I don't know, I've, I've been toying with the idea of, you know, maybe taking like an Afro-German artist and looking at their career, like someone like Gunther Kaufmann, you know, who was in like, you know, numerous films. I, I know, it's problematic, I know, but still I feel like, um, you know, I, I have, I, know. I I favor the film Whitey, which I feel like um, uh, problematizes uh, power relations um, in terms of race and gender. But I feel like to to look at an Afro German's career, you know, maybe you you'll see say films or songs that address racism, but you'll see others that don't that address other topics, and maybe that's a way, you know, of of getting of not focusing in on the negative. Um. <laughs> <laughs> well. Um, well Maybe quick response. I have some other things, but I will do that later. Um, not limited to, to racism is by actually including um, their, uh, the own perspective. I mean, I think that is, uh, you only run into this problem if you're teaching Germ German cultural studies from the hegemonic perspective. Then, of course, of course, we come into, oh, is this dragging, and I probably will be dead by leaving the airport and trying to get on the bus. Huh? But if you, if you include, you know, Maya Eam, Blues and Black and White, a collection of essays, poetry, and conversations, it's very empowering. And, and, and teach it in a way, you know, to look into the empowerment mo uh, 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 moments. Brenwin Okpako is an, um, uh, a Nigerian-German filmmaker who uh, just ha uh, has a no new uh, um, documentary on um, 
uh, Auma uh, Obama, uh, uh, Barack Obama's uh, sister, who um, uh, studied and lived in Germany for a while. Um, there are others, also Gobama is, for example, a very interesting um, documentary following a an, an, an black German filmmaker following the uh, 2008 uh, um, Obama uh, election campaign. Um, a, an, an older one, but well, in, within the black German experience, and um, it is a very relevant uh, film, would be, for example, um, Everything Will Be Fine, uh, which basically was the first um, a major feature film um, uh, uh, about a uh, uh, black German main, or which we dealt with uh, a black German main uh, characters, and talking about intersectionality, um, and also gay sexuality. Um, it's from, from 99, uh, made by uh, Angelina Macarone, and um, the uh, black German scholar Fatima El Taib uh, wrote the, uh, um, the, the, the script for it. Um, uh, other ones would be, you know, uh, that's wh why, because the reason I'm adding it, um, if, if you do Kaufmann, you are ending up in the problem area. <laughs> um, which is cre which is great too. I mean, if you do Kaufmann, you can do Fassbinder, etc., and that is everything is wonderful. But if you don't want to be in the uh, um, problem area, you know, <laughs> look in Charles Muhammad Huber. He has an autobiography out. I don't all love like of that that you know. I mean, it's, he's a Bavarian, you know. It's a, <laughs> um, but he was the first. <laughs> But he was the, fir the first uh, uh, um, major, he had, had the first major role as a detective in, in, a, in a German crime show. Um, Pierre Sanussi Bliss, for example, and he has also an, an own film out. So there is a lot, um, and I think the main point is approach it from the own cultural uh, production, from the own uh, material, and then uh, uh, teach this experience and not trust from the, from, from the majority perspective of being the victim. So actually give subjectivity to blackness and then it develops by itself. Yeah, thank you. I'd, I'd also like, like to add that when, um, um, when, when it is taught like, like, like that, um, not as a problem and not just serving white students or from the white perspective, then th there will also be a shift in who actually feels attracted to, s to go study it. And um, this will be very helpful to, to get more students of color in, in, into the whole um, field. But um, I think, of course, the, um, I mean, the experience without racism is probably not possible. That is why <laughs> you know, racism is bad. <laughs> but, <laughs> yeah. but yeah, if, if you, you focus on an art or cultural output, just as Peggy said, I, I think this can be can be um, beautiful, and I'm just so glad you, you brought up the um, African, American, African oh, yeah. mm -hmm. experience, and this being in Germany, and how it, it is differently negotiated, or negotiated in, in the two countries. Um, because I think that, that is um, what's, what's really, um, what should be the next uh, thing, or the present thing on, on all our agendas right now, like discussing our own power structures within our own communities and our privileges and and all of this and um, yeah I would would love um, us to talk a lot more about this in, in the future and um, also what, what was your very last question when you in, in your introduction you know you read the question because I, I thought like the last question you had already answered so many things ah. mm -hmm. should I read it again how can we make the convincing case to all scholars and teachers of German studies that until they include a focus on the experiences of black Germans and other racialized peoples in Germany, until they acknowledge the importance of race as an analytic category for understanding Germany, their own research will remain flawed and incomplete? Yeah. <laughs> uh, the, the, the woman in the striped dress? That's you. Well, you. <laughs> yes. Microphone, yeah. We'll all touch the microphone. Thank you. Um, okay, so my question is, is, are there any coalition building between other Afro-Europeans and Af with Afro-Germans? So are there like Afro-Dutch and Afro-English and Afro-French like doing any coalition building conferences in Europe? Is anything like that mm -hmm. going on? 
Um, yeah, oh, yes. <laughs> Um, that is basically um, a daily an, an, an a daily, daily life experience. I mean, Europe. Uh, what I always realize when I'm here in this country is um, the reason so many people are monolingual is, uh, yeah, you never hit somebody else. But in in, in Europe, if you really want to move a little bit, just a little bit from state to state, um, you're already experiencing um, an, an, another culture, another uh, language. Um, we um, started in 2004 this uh, um, a research co a coalition uh, on black European studies, um, which held two conferences uh, uh, in, in Germany and one conference here in the US in, um, uh, at the University of Massachusetts in Amherst, um, on, and which brought uh, um, together mainly the scholarship on uh, black European studies, meaning on blackness in in Europe, so really addressing Russia uh, in general, Eastern Europe, uh, France, uh, UK, um, uh, and so forth. Um, there are col uh, uh, collaborations on, on so many levels. There is um, a, a, a collective of artists, for example, you can find them also online. Um, there's, uh, uh, of course, a lot of music projects, uh, um, international, uh, Europe-wide, um, and also uh, uh, political. So um, I think that is also something which we should keep in mind that um, black, black German uh, uh, research, black German uh, identity formation is always um, in a context of a larger European setting. So it's not just this, uh, how do we relate to Germanness? It's always in a larger European setting. Hi. Um, um, I, uh, first of all, thank you very much for your talks and your presentations and responses. And hi. Um, um, this is very stimulating. I um, have a question. I'll start the question with a brief anecdote, and then I'll lead it into uh, sort of a question about interdisciplinary uh, or into the possibilities for interdisciplinariness in scholarship, and then also how to integrate that into the classroom. So two years ago, I was in the um, Neue Blick Seminar with the AATG in, in Berlin, and we were looking at multicultural Berlin. Um, and we did spend some time with um, Katharina Oguntoye and the, at the Joliba and, and some of her friends and associates and so forth. And, um, and speaking with these, these people, um, you know, it struck me that a lot of them are gay. Um, and so I was wondering whether that is something that is in the black German studies scholarship at all. I know that work, there is some work on that, but I was wondering to what extent that is being focused on or more integrated, especially if we think about minority studies as part of German studies. Um, but now this is not, this is not from irgendwo hergeholt, sondern um, I'm actually also wondering whether more can be made of this because of Audre Lorde, obviously, right? Um, and with, when I teach um, my IEM in the classroom here, and I have to just mention that I do that in an English composition classroom, I teach my IEM in translation, but I access it through Audre Lorde and through also her circle of, uh, you know, lesbian feminist activists, authors, and writers, who also have strong connections to CUNY, where I teach, and then use that as a way to come to my AIM and, and so forth and so forth. So I guess that's my question. If you have any responses to that, thank you. Anybody want to answer here? Um, okay, yeah, then I should stop talking. Uh, but I, before I stop talking, I shamelessly will advertise um, <laughs> something. Um, I'm actually right now finishing up an anthology will, which will come out in, in, in fall on Audre Lorde and the black feminist movement which addresses some of these questions as well. And um, at least well in my classroom that is always an, an, an important um, topic and, and issue and I try to actually um, point the, uh, only point that out to my students and let to make them the connections that it is very interesting that the um, Basically, the beginning of the activist movement uh, in Germany was very much uh, carried out by by uh, uh, lesbians, by by gay activists, and and uh, came from this feminist movement. And to say this connection with Audre Lorde, this is one aspect, of course. 
Um, but it is very interesting to see that uh, women are more in the more political activist uh, uh, circles in, in, in the 80s and start, starting out to writing themselves into a, a larger German discourse. And the men um, in the early 90s um, started out to, to bring themselves into a musical discourse. So, and I think it has something to do, of course, with where the feminist movement uh, and the feminist wave was in Europe in the 80s. And also not just to say, well, the, the girls were just uh, smarter uh, or, or more, uh, more proficient, uh, but, but also it tells us something and it always kicks, out, um, kicks off uh, um, interesting uh, uh, discussions in my, in my classes on um, the, the limitations and the possibilities of uh, for black masculinity, for example, in the 1980s. That this was something which was accessible for black women being part of the feminist movement. I mean, Katarina, you met Katarina, that is where she came from. She was already an, an old school activist in the, in the, uh, in the feminist movement. Um, black men in the 70s and 80s didn't have um, a space where they could form a positive notion of, of black masculinity. And that basically came in through the cultural program, not just the music, but the cultural program of hip hop, um, uh, uh, in the in the late 80s and then in the early 90s with uh, um, advanced chemistry and that that tells us also a lot about how this movement started out and also how um, the 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 second generation of this uh, uh, community actually got their notions of masculinity and and, and black femininity. Yes, in the back. You. Um. Well, actually, uh, what I was, I was actually responding, I wanted to respond to something earlier. Uh, when you talked about, when you asked about how to talk about something other than racism, when we talk about uh, Afro-Deutsch, or when we talk about black people, uh, when we just talk about problems. And I think that's possible. I th think you can have different messengers for different things. You spoke to empowerment. You can also talk about social justice and how uh, text and how discourse can bring about change. That's one thing. The other thing is we look at this as art. These are beautiful stories. And the students see that. When I do stories with my students, whether it's in a course that has to do just with people of color or afro deutsch or, or whether it's in any other course, they'll, they'll see the story, they'll see the beauty of the story, and they'll tell me what's there. And they see all kinds of things. And I think they're wonderful opportunities because they, there are some beautiful texts there to look at, and you can look at the language, the music, the rhythm, you can look at the art, as well as the, the other messages, which might be uh, social justice, racism, or any of the other things. So I think we can let some of the texts speak for, the, uh, for themselves. We can see that the group is not monolithic. The students can hear that too. They can hear the differences in the voices. And I think they're just magnificent things. And I'm so, when we, I studied uh, German way, way back in the Middle Ages, None of this was, uh, was open, and it's wonderful to see the world keep opening and opening and opening. And I thought I saw Philip come in a while back. He was sitting here, and he says he's, uh, there's something new coming out. So it, it keeps growing, which is, which is wonderful. And I'm, he I'm happy to hear that you're coming out with something new, too. It's great. Um, there's a man in the back. Hi, my name is Jonathan Wiesen. I teach at Southern Illinois University, and I'm a historian, so these might be very specific to my discipline. But first, a uh, question to Priscilla Lane. That wonderful sign you showed of the Mayaim Ufa, do you make more of that in class? Because it's such a wonderful German thing to see those striking through of the old oh. sign. So I'm wondering what the old name street of the uh, street was and whether the students can talk f further about what it means to think through history, update history, and how the town, how the city actually went about getting that sign up there. I think it would be a wonderful exercise. Uh, more broadly to uh, all of you, do you find when you're teaching the black German experience that the students are drawn to, more specifically to nat national socialism? Now this is something I face obviously as 20th century historian of Germany, but also who teaches Jewish German history. Uh, do you have to fight against the desire to make the 1933 to 1945 the centerpiece of black German history? Uh, or are students more specifically drawn still in 2012 to that particular Third Reich um, 
uh, era, and you've answered it in some ways when you talk about not just victimization, not just discrimination, but I'm wondering if you have, are facing pedagogical challenges based on the uh, continuing interest of the students in the Nazi period. Um, now, oh, about the street signs, I'm fuzzy on the details of the story, but um, the, this um, Ufa, what is Ufa in English? Bay. Is it Bay? Oh, Bank. Well, um, River Bank. So this River Bank um, was named after um, someone who was famous during the uh, Germany's colonial period in Africa. I, again, his, well, his, it was called Gruben Ufa. Um, but I, I can't remember his full name um, or what, what he's known for. But I know that the controversy was that um, his activities definitely weren't good. Uh, I mean, German, <laughs> Germany's colonial past is really awful. You know, a lot of atrocious things happen. So the argument was, you know, not only that Mayim, you know, deserved um, a street named after her, but also that you, you needed to, you know, replace this, this negative history or, or stop honoring these, um, I know, ghosts from the past, you know, who are known for doing awful things. Um, and I did mention this briefly um, to students. Um, I, I also, you know, I talked about other places in Berlin where there were streets named after Nazis and, and that was changed. And kind of, yeah, the controversy of, you know, what, what street signs do you change and, and where do you stop, you know, which is, in Germany that's really difficult um, because you have so many of these instances. Um, well, that's that's what they say. I mean, there are a lot of there are a lot of streets in Berlin. I mean, Morgenstrasse. You know, there there are tons of to me problematic street names in Berlin, and that was the argument of the other side. You yeah. know, that this will never end uh, if you start renaming things, um, which I don't agree with. I'm just you know saying that was the other argument. <laughs> um, and as, yeah, as far as um, students' interest in, in Nazism or in the Third Reich, um, I actually, this summer, uh, just taught a course called Hitler in Hollywood, um, which was all about films about, are depicting na National Socialism, American and German films. Um, and I had um, a, an African-American student in the class, um, and on the first day of class, you know, he said, you know, I'm really interested in this topic. It's kind of embarrassing. He was like, because, you know, if I were alive during this time, they probably would have killed me or something. And I actually was able to mention your book, <laughs> Tina, and say, you know, well, it's a little bit more complicated than that. And I, you know, could say a few words about, you know, the Afro-German uh, history during this time. But, um, yeah, it was interesting, um, yeah, to have an African-American student in a, cl in a class like that. Um, and, you know, it... It, it made it possible to talk about um, these issues, although none of the films that we watched, you know, addressed race, unfortunately, or you know, anti-black racism. We just, Tina? Okay, can I, I wonder if I, if the panelists would, since we're almost out of time, if the panelists would have any words to wrap up this discussion before we move on to more exciting discussions. Um. Yes. Yes. <laughs> well, uh, I think wrap up is a it, it's a huge thing. Um, and, well, we just start, started out. Um, I actually wanted to come back to one of the first questions, which might be kind of a wrap up about the colorism and the the differences. I mean, that is one one of the main question while driving this this conference is conference here to to um, to what extent do we actually talk about the same or do we have the same notions or concepts like colorism what what you cited and um, as, as Noah said well uh, um, colorism is is everywhere and um, because racism is an international notion however it has national embedded uh, codes and while we do have uh, to deal with uh, colorism within our own community, and we um, more and more address this also in uh, in Germany. It is also important to uh, uh, mention and not to forget that um, within the German history, black is black. Um, it is basically in 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 a way that 
um, I'm not being seen as a brown person and for that um, I have a better chance of surviving in, in Hoyerswerda or in Marzahn than maybe somebody who um, is uh, more dark-skinned. And we, we need to be careful not to bring that some notions which come also to us um, from an international setting of, of racism um, and bring that then back to uh, in, in, in exchange with each other. It is a uh, divide and conquer notion. Um, I had this discussion uh, uh, years ago with my father um, from, uh, fr from Nigeria who, who thought, and that is of course coming from a, a perspective in Nigeria, that we are basically white. Um, that we are privileged and um, when I'm in Nigeria, I be seen as this European woman or the, the woman coming with a passport to be, be able to leave and, um, and um, also this imagination of, of, of economic su su success. Um, and, but this is something different from growing up uh, uh, in, in, in Germany, this notion of, oh, you're not that dark-skinned or you're not that black like in Africa didn't make um, any differences. So it is more complicated. While, of course, colorism is, an, is, is, uh, uh, is a fact, um, it is always embedded. Racism plays out on a national, in a national setting. And that, is, and that comes back to what we're doing here to, uh, yeah, to learn from each other. We need to know, we have to have more historical context, we need to know more about how all of these concepts and notions play out in our very circumstances to understand each other and not just coming from this perspective of, oh, um, it is harsher or worse in my house or where I'm coming from, you have no idea of this experience. That is always um, probably the, the, yeah, the destructive approach rather than to say, well, let's, let's see what, how it is playing out in your, in your context. Um, Noah, as you, uh, I hope you have some words, but I wanted to ask you about something you mentioned which hasn't been brought up again. You said that you think Afro-Deutsch is different than Afro-German, and mm -hmm. I think that's important for us Americans to know because at this point we, we use Afro-German and Black German pretty interchangeably, yeah. so could you just tell us what you mean by that and help uh, us uh, learn. Afro-Deutsch is, is a German word. <laughs> like right. That is the word. Right, you but, know? <laughs> but you said it's, you don't think it's the yeah. same as Afro-German. Yeah, because um, the, 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 what's, the, what, what's the word for, for Selbstbezeichnung? Self-definition. Yeah, the self-definition, uh, I think, she should always um, get a preference. Like how, how a group is being named is, is okay. not um, you know, the same thing, in my opinion, as what a group, group calls names themselves. Mm -hmm. So, um, and talking about, on this panel, about power structures or, you know, how the, the discourse, uh, now the power in the discourse was very much on the on the side of the United States. Why why would I um, choose to call myself uh, other than my Um and and make it make it easier um, for you know English English speaking people and, and change my own group's name? Um, I don't think this would be quite structurally the right thing to do, and um, I think it's it's uh, it's not um, hard to pronounce Afro Deutsch. And, <laughs> In the, in, in the right way, when, especially when you're teaching German studies. So, uh, here's my appeal to call us Amen. <laughs> Is there anything else you'd like to say in conclusion to the hand? I know, thanks. Um, like, I, I, th I think this field is, is so widespread and there's so many interesting things being brought up and, and each one of them would be a point for yet another three panels and I wouldn't really, you know, I'd love to discuss all this further and, and work and just stick together and, um, yeah, I wouldn't really know how to draw a conclusion on that. Okay. Priscilla? Um, <laughs> yeah, I don't have any, necessarily have any final thoughts. I'm sure we'll continue this um, in very productive and exciting ways, so, but let's thank our panel right now.